it looks really cold in here. Well, welcome polar bear buddies. Thanks for joining us for another episode of our Winter Kids Club. My name is Sarah. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And today we're gonna to talk about this habitat. Do you recognize it? Does it look familiar? Definitely doesn't look like any habitat around here that we're familiar with. So we're gonna be exploring the Arctic today and we're gonna explore some of the animals that make their home in this habitat. Now we'd love to hear from you today and we have a couple ways for you to reach out. So if you have any questions about this habitat or any of the animals we're talking about, you can text us at this number, it's 562-286-1838. So you can ask questions, you can share your observations using this text line. Now this is for if you're watching live, which means it's about 12.05 on January 6th, you can text us. Uh, and I have James sitting at our computer and he's gonna take all your questions and observations and send them in to me. But if you're watching this program and we're no longer alive, so it's not quite that time, we still wanna hear from you. We wanna be able to answer any of your questions. We just ask that you email us and that email address is just below the phone number. It's live at lbaop.org. All right, explorers, are you ready to get started? So as I mentioned, I'm not alone here in the studio. I have James who's taking your questions and Cynthia is gonna control what you see behind me. Now she has this picture of the Arctic, this habitat right here. Now that word habitat, what does that mean? Have you heard it before? pretty common word. We talk about it a lot when we talk about different animals and in the science world when we're learning about where animals might live. So a habitat is a home. It's where the animal lives. And it can be really small. It can be really big. It's sort of their community, what is around them. So this Arctic is a habitat for some special animals. But first, what do you notice when you look at this habitat? So go ahead, take a moment. We'll put up a couple different pictures of the Arctic. And I want you to make some observations. So I want you to take a look and text us, let us know, what do you see? What do you notice? Anything that looks surprising to you? Anything you recognize? Anything you have questions about? What do you see? Ooh, that's kind of cool. So one thing that I definitely notice is there's lots of this white stuff what do you think that is? Snow, definitely snow or even ice. So there is definitely a lot of snow and ice here at the Arctic. What else do you notice? Did you see any water? Yep, there's some water, but it's kind of hidden by all that snow and ice. So it's sort of underneath here. If we break up this ice, there's definitely water underneath there, but take a look at the color of the water. What do you notice about that? It's really dark, I agree. So that water is really dark colored. So when you look at this habitat, what do you think it feels like if we're there? Cold, definitely cold. I'm cold here in our office and it's we're in Southern California, so I can't imagine being there. You'd probably need a lot of special gear in order to live or explore the Arctic. Ah, oh, look at that, look how big that coat is. So lots of layers, lots of warm, puffy coats in order to stay nice and warm in this habitat. Now we see this person in some buildings here, but in those other images we looked at, did you see a lot of houses or parks or buildings or even people or animals? Not too many. So people do live there, animals do live here, but it definitely doesn't look like the cities or the communities that we see around here it looks very different. Now I see that James is writing some observations. So I'm gonna hold off from moving on to see what you all are sharing about observations or questions you have about the Arctic so far. Cause I do wanna bring up, while we're waiting, I'm gonna bring up an image of the earth. So we have this really cool app that we can use. It's called Science on a Sphere, SOS. And it shows us a the globe and then we can also bring up some data sets so some information gathered we're just going to look at what we call the blue marble so here is the united states right we're over here in california but i want to show you where the arctic is because there's two areas on our globe that can be really really cold and look like we were just looking at we have the antarctic which is going to be down here all the way at the bottom but we are going to be talking about the arctic so it's above the United States above Canada, over there near Alaska, above here, kind of near Canada, 
So all this ice here that you see, that is part of the Arctic. All right, let's see what observations you all shared. Ms. Amador's class, thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, so you wanna know how many species are in the Arctic? Ooh, there are 5,500 aquatic species. So that's the different types of animals we'll find in the water, aquatic means in the water. So 5,500 different types of animals live in this habitat. Did that number surprise you? Definitely surprised me because this is not the easiest habitat to live in. All right, Edward, he, Edward sees ice. Absolutely, Edward, great observation. Ah, and then someone asked, what causes the ice to come up so high out of the water? That's a good question. So it has to do with buoyancy. Have you heard that word before? Buoyancy is when things float. So the ice actually floats. Here it is. So it comes right up to the surface. All right, and then Alexa says it looks freezing cold. I agree, Alexa. I wore my t-shirt, a sweatshirt, and then a fleece jacket over today into the office, which is probably a little too much than I needed. But imagine being here, you would need so many more layers and warmer insulation to stay warm in this habitat. And Jasmine asks, how can I help animals that live there? Ooh, that's a great question, Jasmine. You know, one way to help animals who live there is just learning about them. Because we may not know too much about the animals who live here. I had to prepare for this class and I was thinking, I don't know that much about some of these animals we're gonna talk about. And so I was doing some research. So by tuning in today and learning about these animals, that's the first step in helping these animals because you'll know more about them. So are we ready to take a look at some of the animals who live in this habitat? Actually, I'm gonna pump the brakes for just a moment. I want you to think first, what challenges do these animals face living in this habitat? Because there are 5,500 animals who live in the water, and then there's probably more animals who live on land. But like I said, this is a tough habitat to live in, right? It's gonna be tough for us, so it's gonna be tough for these animals too. So when we start to talk about these animals, I want you to think about some challenges that these animals might face. Now, we are gonna start by talking about a bird a bird that lives in this habitat. Now, does anyone have a guess of what bird we're gonna talk about? Because there's a bird that I think people might think lives in this habitat, but it actually doesn't. It lives in a similar habitat, but somewhere completely different. So if you were thinking, if you were thinking penguins, that's a great guess, because there are some penguins who do live on sea ice like this, but penguins live in the Antarctic. So they live at the bottom of our globe and up at the Arctic at the top, we have a different type of bird. We find puffins. So let's see a picture of a puffin. Look at that. That's a pretty cool picture. That's a puffin in flight. So puffins are what we call seabirds. So they are really good flyers, but they're also really good swimmers. And you can see this puffin would probably need to swim because what does it have in its mouth? It's got fish. So we have a type of puffin here at the aquarium. We have horned puffins and tufted puffins. The type of puffin you'll find up in the Arctic is the Arctic puffin. So we don't have that specific type here, but we do have some cool pictures and I think even some video of the puffins that we have here at the aquarium. Now these birds, they are built for a life out at sea. So they will come onto the rocks uh, and they'll make their nest there, but they spend a lot of time out on the water. And they spend a lot of time in the water looking for food. So you can see this puffin has some fish in their mouth. So they'll eat things like herring, um, another fish called hake, smaller, we call them silver sides, smaller silver fish. Ooh, look at this puffin. What do you notice about this puffin? There's some really cool features of this animal. So they have that really large beak and that beak is used to grab up their food and they can actually carry quite a bit of fish in their beak and then they'll take it back to their nest and if they have young they'll definitely feed it to their young. Now we were looking up to see how many fish a puffin can hold in their beak and we think that they can hold upwards on record something like 50 or 60 fish but generally they'll grab about 10 to 15 fish in their beak and like we saw before they'll have them hanging out of their beak on either side so you can actually see when they've got food they kind of scoop it up with that big beak. Now here is gonna be a video of our puffins. It looks like they're flying through the water, but they're actually swimming. And so their wings are built specially, not only to fly, but to allow them to be in the water. It's kind of like they got the zoomies going back and forth. 
So puffins are one animal that we would find. So those are, these are another seabird, but we do have puffins in here. There we go. Look at that beak. And the interesting thing is the color of their beak. You can see the orange and red, and their beak can actually change color with the seasons. So these puffins, they are a type of bird we'll find in the Arctic. Now, one thing thinking about this bird who lives in the Arctic, that there's going to need to be something special about their feathers. So their feathers are what cover their body. That is what they use to help keep them warm. So their feathers are going to need to be very thick and downy, really soft and fluffy in order to keep them warm in those colder temperatures. So we've got one animal that we find in the Arctic. One of all those animals we talk, we said that there are that 500, 5,500 species. We've got our puffins. So let's move on to another animal. Now, this animal, we do have a question that came in about it. So Lendi wanted to know, are polar bears really all white except for their nose? So let's talk about polar bears. Now look at this. Looking at this picture, it would seem that Lendi is correct, right? What color do you see in this image? We see the snow or ice. We see the polar bear. Looks like they have black nose, maybe their jaw, their eyes, and the rest of their body is covered in white fur. Now, to, just looking at it, definitely looks white, but I'm gonna tell you something special about polar bears that's kind of shocking and hard to imagine. Polar bears, their skin is actually all black, similar to their nose. And the fur on their body is actually clear. But with the way the light reflects on their body, it makes them look white. Kind of weird, right? So underneath all that fur, if we were to move the fur away, or if for some reason you shaved a polar bear, it would look black underneath, and those hairs of that fur is gonna be clear. But as I said, because the way the light reflects, it makes them look the color that they are. Now, thinking about them looking all white, why do you think a polar bear looks all white? That's an interesting question. So go ahead and remember, you can text us in, why do you think the polar bear, their body looks all white? Is that helpful? Is it just a random color? That their body is or is there a specific reason that polar bears are this color i'm gonna let you think about that question and send in your answers while we talk a little bit more about these animals so polar bears are a marine mammal now if you tuned in earlier today we talked about whales we talked about elephant seals we talked about all other types of marine mammals here's a good shot of a polar bear we spent a lot of time talking about marine mammals today and we covered a couple things the characteristics that make a mammal a mammal Things like warm-blooded, having hair or fur, uh, using your lungs to breathe, giving live birth, and feeding your young milk. And then we took it even further and we talked about marine mammals. So marine mean, meaning the ocean or water-related. So it's pretty obvious to us things like whales and dolphins and seals and sea lions, they're marine mammals because they spend all their time or most of their time in the water. But you may not think of a polar bear who you might think spends more time on land than in the water you may not consider it a marine mammal. However, it absolutely is a marine mammal. And that's because it spends not only a lot of time in the water, but it relies on the ocean for survival. So it spends a lot of time in the water looking for food and its food source comes straight from that ocean. And so that makes it a marine mammal. Ah, Jasmine responded and said that they are white for camouflage. You got it, great job. So they are white for camouflage. So the color of their fur helps them blend in to the ice and snow for protection, and that can protect them from any predators. It also helps them to stay blending in when they're looking to hunt for another animal, and so they can sneak up on their prey. So definitely for camouflage, look at this. Now we can, we can find the polar bear, but it's kind of tricky. And for animals who maybe don't have the best eyesight, this animal blends in nicely to that ice and snow. Now polar bears are very large animals. Male polar bears can weigh about almost a thousand pounds, about 990 pounds, and they range from about seven to 10 and a half feet, 10 feet long. And the females are a little bit smaller. They're about 500 pounds and six to eight feet. So they are very large animals. Now they have that fur to help them blend in. And the fur can also help keep them warm because they definitely need to stay warm in the, in the cold temperatures. But they also have something else in their body that helps keep them warm. We've talked about it earlier today, if you were watching, they have an extra layer of fat in their body. Do you remember what that fat is called? Ah, Cynthia says blubber. I think it's a really fun word to say. You can say it out loud. You can say it quietly, but blubber 
is what they have in their body that helps insulate, helps keep them warm so that they are not too cold in these cold temperatures. Now, polar bears will use their fur and their blubber to stay warm, but they will also build a den. Now, you may have a den in your house. We used to call our office in my parents' house, we call it a den. But a den for a polar bear is kind of like a cave. They might dig out that ice and snow or uh, kind of scrape it away to make a little space for them. It's kind of like a little house. And they can stay in here. The polar bears can use that to hide, to take a rest, to, to kind of make that their home. And so polar bears are often found in dens. So here is a picture of a den. I think we have a couple other pictures of some polar bear dens. Look at that. That's looking up through the den. So someone climbed into that polar bear den. So they might kind of carve it out of the side of ice or cliffs. They might kind of dig into the snow. Any way they can create a space that can keep them safe and protected. And it can also keep them warm. Think about in this habitat if there's a lot of wind or if it's snowing, if there's a lot of movement in the air, that can maybe chill that animal. So hiding in a den where they're safe from that wind, that can help keep them warm. So polar bears use these dens for protection, for warmth. It is their home. All right. So I think we have a couple more polar bear pictures just because they're really cute to see the polar bear cubs. <laughs> Look at that. So we call the babies a cub. And their fur looks even more white than that adult to blend in. It's just so cute. Even though these are massive animals. Look how little that little cub is. Excellent. All right, and then Cindy told me we have a cool swimming video. So like I said, they do spend a lot of time at sea. So here's an adult, probably a mama and her cub, maybe looking for food or moving from place to place. So that sea ice you see in there is actually really important for these animals because while they do spend a lot of time in the water, they are gonna need to get out of the water. So they're gonna need a means to get out of the water and back onto land. All right, we have a couple more questions that came in. So Sophia wants to know what whales live in the Arctic and Alexa wants to know, do seals or walruses live there too? Well, great question, Sophia and Alexa, because all three of those animals can be found in the Arctic. We do have whales, we do have seals, and we do have walruses. Now the types of these animals is gonna depend. Oh, look at that. There's one type of whale an orca. So we will find orca whales up in the Arctic. Now orcas are actually a type of dolphin. They're the largest dolphin. And all dolphins are whales. It's a whole confusing thing. But we call them toothed whales because if we were to look in their mouth, we would find a full set of teeth on our orca. So here's our orca. And orcas, we can recognize them a couple ways. We see that coloration, right? That black back, that white spot that kind of looks like it could be an eye, and then the white belly. And then, then we see that large dorsal fin. So this is a really big marker of an orca, is that big dorsal fin. And that dorsal fin can be about six feet tall, which means that's taller than me. So just that part of that orca, that dorsal fin, can be about six feet tall. And that fin is really important. It helps keep this animal balanced as they're swimming. So we see dorsal fins on whales, on dolphins, on fish, on sharks. And the larger the dorsal fin, that gives us a clue that that animal is going to be able to swim a lot faster. So orcas are strong and powerful and fast swimmers. And we know that because of their dorsal fin. Look at that dorsal fin. Kind of interesting too, we can use that dorsal fin as one way to identify individual orca whales. Because if you notice between this one and that video we were watching, the, sh the, sorry, the specific shape of that dorsal fin is a little bit different. And sometimes the color pattern's a little different, different as well. And then we do have seals and walruses that live in the Arctic. And I believe we have a lot of walrus pictures. Cynthia, let me know. So let's take a look at some walruses. Look at that. So walruses, they look similar to seals and sea lions, and they are in the same family. They are what we call pinnipeds. So they're marine mammals, but the family, the way that seals and sea lions and walruses are connected is they are called pinnipeds, which means feather footed or feather fins. And so we can't really see it on this one, but their tail kind of looks like feathers. And that's the same for seals, sea lions, and walruses. Now, walruses are larger than most seals and sea lions. Right? They also have a lot of blubber. Think about living in this ice and rolling around in it. You need to stay warm. And our walruses, 
they don't look too fuzzy. So it doesn't look like they have a lot of hair or fur on their body. So you bet they have a lot of blubber there inside their body. Now, what else do you notice on the walrus? What are these things right here? Have you seen them before? Right, they're tusks. Those are tusks. So walruses have those tusks on their face. Now, what do you think those tusks are used for? Are they just decoration to make the animal look really cool? Let's think about that for a moment. How could those tusks be used or how are they helpful for the walrus? So there could be a couple reasons. If you think about why an animal might have big tusks like this, you might think defense or trying to get to their food. But what these walruses will really use their tusks for is one thing is to help them haul out. So what that means is this animal will be in the water looking for food, swimming around, and then they may need to come onto land or onto that ice. And so those tusks can be used sort of as an anchor, right? If we're climbing out of a pool, we might grab a hold of a ladder or a slide and pull our body out. So walruses, they don't have hands like us. So they'll use their tusks to kind of anchor themselves in and pull themselves out of the water. Or if they need to dig into the snow for whatever reason or the ice, or they need to kind of scrape away to make an opening for them to go in the water, they can use their tusks for that as well. So those tusks are really important. And speaking of tusks, we're gonna move on to our last animal in just a moment. Thinking about a tusk, you have a guess of what animal we might be talking about. And I'm gonna take the last couple questions that I see we have coming. So one question is, what is a group of polar bears called? Ah, this one is great. Now, before I tell you what it's called, I do see a note that James left me that says, they rarely appear in groups though. So you might see like this, where there's a mother with her cubs, but they're rarely seen in larger groups. But when we do see polar bears in a group, they're called a celebration. Maybe because we don't see them that often, that when we do see them in groups, we wanna party or they wanna party. Or scientists get so excited, I don't know, but that's a fun name. Looking up the groups or the names for groups of animals is always fun because some of them can be pretty silly or pretty fun, like a celebration of polar bears. Excellent. All right, we have about two minutes left, so we're going to cover one last Arctic animal, and I'm going to have Cynthia bring it up. Ta-da! Now, when I mentioned tusks, did you think of this animal? Do you recognize this animal? Now it kind of looks like a couple different things here. We've got a tusk, kind of like a walrus, the body, maybe like a seal or a sea lion, maybe like a whale or a dolphin. Do you know what this is? Sometimes people call them the unicorns of the sea, but there's actually a narwhal. Have you heard about a narwhal before? So narwhals, they are another marine mammal we find in the Arctic. Here we go, look at this, a pod of narwhals. And one thing you'll notice or how they get that nickname, the unicorn of the sea, is that giant tusk, or it's actually a tooth that grows straight out the front of their head. Can you imagine if only one of your teeth just kept growing and growing and growing and growing and growing? Might be pretty uncomfortable for us, but that's what this is. Now, pretty cool. I actually have a narwhal tusk to show you. Now it doesn't quite fit all the way into our screen, maybe if I back up a little bit. So it's pretty long. Here we go, there we go, finally got the whole thing. This is what a narwhal tusk looks like. Now, I am about five foot two. So this narwhal tusk is the same height as me. So their tusk can be really, really long. Now, both males and females can have this tusk, although it's much more common to see in male narwhals and less common to see in females, although it has been seen. Now, why do you think a narwhal has a tusk like this or a tooth that grows really long. There's definitely a couple of reasons that would come to my mind as ideas, right? We might think it might be defense to protect them, or if it's more often seen in males than females, maybe it's a display to attract a female. But this tooth actually has a lot of nerve endings in it. It has something like 10 million nerve endings in it. So it's actually used as a sensory organ. So it can sense and help explore around the habitat or around the area where that narwhal is. So that means it can maybe feel the movement of other animals or it can feel for other predators or prey or other narwhals. So it's a sensory organ to help it explore its surroundings. 
pretty neat, right? Who would have thought that this animal has a giant tooth coming out of the, its face that helps it explore its habitat? Now, we just barely touched the surface of all the aquatic or marine animals that we could find in the Arctic, but we are out of time. So I hope you enjoyed learning about a couple of those animals and maybe it piqued your interest to do a little bit more research and learn more about them. Now, we do have an activity uh, that goes along with this program as with all of our winter kids club programs and it's to build a polar bear den. So think about that kind of ice cave that these polar bears built as a way to protect themselves from the elements, from the weather, as a place to take a rest. And you can try and build your own polar bear den in your home. So you'll find all those instructions on our website uh, on, in our Winter Kids Club. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us. We have done with programming for today, but we have more Winter Kids Club coming up tomorrow. See you then.